Idlewild Arts respectfully acknowledges the Kawishba Kawiakna, also known as Kawia Band of Indians, and all nine sovereign bands of Kawia people who have stewarded this land throughout the generations and continue to steward this land for all future generations. Idlewild Arts Foundation is proud to present One World, One Idlewild, the series. In conversation with Pamela Jordan, the series brings together thought leaders, creatives, influencers, and change makers, highlighting the work of citizen artists whose careers and lives have been shaped by the transformative power of art. Have the courage to lead. The best thing that ever happened to me was the Northridge earthquake. Artists throughout the world, we are the speakers of truth. We are the most authentic expression of the day of the times. Be determined to get the most you can from every opportunity. And where you don't see opportunities, ask for them. Great leaders recognize that the work requires urgent patience. You can learn about classroom management. You can learn about the new curriculum. You can learn about the new way to teach whatever it is. But at the end of the day, if those students feel that love, they're more likely to listen, they're more likely to trust, they're more likely to be vulnerable. And in that space, that's where you can change some kid's life. From Idlewild Arts Foundation in Idlewild, California, I am Pamela Jordan with One World, One Idlewild, the series. Today, I'm excited to bring to you a rebroadcast of my conversation on January 22nd, 2021 with singer-songwriter Tan Bowie. Your parents left Vietnam around 1981, and you embraced music at a very young age. Were your parents supportive of your desire to be a musician? I wouldn't say that I had the support of mom and dad to become a musician, but I remember that as a young age, they, su they supported me just to do whatever I wanted to do, to learn whatever that I wanted to learn. Uh, and it wasn't until much later when I was about 17 and, you know, I was sitting with my friends for the first time singing karaoke in Melbourne. And I was singing a boys to men song. Um, because I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm a huge boys to men fan. I was singing "End of the Road," boys to men, and and my, 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 after I sang the song, there was silence, and I'm like, was I that bad that I couldn't get some kind of round of applause? But then I realized that my mates was, were completely shocked that that, you know, that sort of came out, and and that feeling that that, that they gave me and all that kind of stuff, plus the fact that I. You know, I always, you know, I always admired you know, people like Stevie Wonder, Ray Charles, Michael Jackson, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I always wanted to sort of be, be an artist. But it was that night as a 17-year-old that I thought, you know what, I'm going to give this a good, good red shot and, um, and I'm going to do it. But that, that same summer, when I got my marks from, from year 12, I knew that I had to convince mum and dad that I that this is what I wanted to do. So I sat down with them and I remember very clearly, it was like, you know, this, this warm day in Melbourne and I knew I had the marks to get into medicine. That's what mummy mother wanted me to do, to be the typical doctor. And dad wanted me to be a, a to do commerce law. And I sat down and I said to them, mum and dad, I really appreciate what you want for me, but I want to become an artist, a singer, songwriter. And then you had this, this deathly silence for about two minutes. And they literally just said, if you want to do that, then you can leave. And I'm like, what do you mean leave? And they get, well, if you want to do that, then you can leave, meaning go, leave, do it. And that was many years later, I thought your know, mother would sit down with me and said, that was just her saying, you know, just, just you know, testing me out but she didn't expect me to actually leave. But that's exactly what happened. And I came back literally eight years later and, um, and I said to her, look, I've, you know, I've done A, B, C, D. I've signed my first record deal, second record deal, done this, my publishing, blah, 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 blah. And finally, as a 25 year old, I, I, um, I came back and I said, and, and we, we made peace, you know? And, and uh, so that, that's sort of the, 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 the quick story in terms of trying to do 
music because I was an Asian kid growing up in an Australian uh, society and I, obviously you know we are a minority in, in Australia and so I always felt a little bit left out I always felt that you know how am I going to break into music and my mother would constantly tell me son there's no one on tv there's no one there's no Asian artists that are broken internationally so what makes you think you can do it you know so just don't 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 think in the clouds don't just go and do go and get a good job get you know, become a doctor make a good living and live better than the way that we used to live because you know mum and dad didn't have an education they came to Australia with no language nothing they were potato pickers they were they worked on the farms then they learned how to sew jeans. And so for many, many years, we were living in these sweatshops, making jeans for three, four, five dollars a pop and living, surviving and, 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 and very lucky to sort of get through all those situations. The mother just wanted me to you know, pick up the pen, write something and feel, you know, feel better about life and have a different status in society. And I said to her, look, you know, mother, I, I'd rather live... Uh, you know, die than live a heart, than, than live a life half lived, and then when I sort of think back as a seventeen year old and standing up to your mother like that, I'm like, woo, okay. <laughs> This is One World, One Idlewild, the series, presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. My name is Pamela Jordan. Here's another clip from my conversation with Tan Bui as we discuss his return to Vietnam to build an ecosystem from education to arts and culture to media. Why did you feel it was time to, to move back to Vietnam and to, to really share uh, yourself as an artist at that time? It just, you know, like I said before, having begun to connect with my roots, I then I just had this pull, this 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 pull back to my home, to, to the homeland, and to retrace my steps and to sort of really find out who I was, you know, and and I did after um, Idol, I did a show in America called Paris by Night which is a very famous Vietnamese variety show that I think has won some Emmys and all that kind of stuff. And I did the show and uh, Paris by Night 96, and I remember very, very clearly. And I sang a song called Mirror Mirror, which was for the first time in my life I'd sung half Vietnamese, half English. And, you know, the response was, it was out of this world. Like I, I thought when I, when I hear back the recording in Vietnamese, I, I, f- you know, I'm not sure whether people actually understood what I said because I still don't understand what I said. You know? <laughs> Did they feel sorry for me? But you know, I, I, but I, I can't listen to that because my Vietnamese is horrible. You know, and and it was because of that song that in Vietnam everyone started to it kind of blew up in Vietnam and and I was so humbled by that. And then they, you know, a lot of the the, the producers, the artists, they called me and they said, "Tom." come back to Vietnam and, and, and see what it's like back in the homeland. And I thought, what the, really? Like, I'd, I'd never been back as an adult, you know. So I, I, I literally said, you know what, I'm just going to go back. And then my mother said once again, she goes, don't go back. And dad says to me, we almost died three times getting out to give you a new life. What are you doing going back? And that really hit home, Pamela. That's like, whoa, this this sense of the, 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 cause mom and dad don't talk very much about the war. They don't talk about their experiences. And I just realized that that pain is still there. They haven't quite moved on yet, you know? And once again, just being the very hard headed boy that I am, I, I said, you know what? I'm going back. It doesn't matter. And so literally two weeks later, bought a plane that had no return date. I went back, I met up with everyone and things happened in a way it was very serendipitous and, and then I'm, I'm Forbidden happened, which was the first single of, um, which was the lead single of my first album. But that was also um, the theme song for the movie, um, Le Mai Tân, uh, which became at that time the biggest movie in Vietnam box office wise. And so it was just all of a sudden, biggest box office, biggest song of the country, boom, second song I'd sung in Vietnamese in my life. And I'm like, okay something's going on that I can't explain. There's a bit of magic going on. So I should listen to my heart and just, you know, really start to, um, to, to, to sort of, you know, 
find out who I am. And that's what I did. Yeah. You're listening to One World, One Idlewild, the series presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. My name is Pamela Jordan. We'll be right back. Idlewild Arts Academy is an independent boarding arts high school whose mission is to change lives through the transformative power of art. Located just two hours inland from Los Angeles and San Diego and one hour from Palm Springs, the school sits on 205 acres of forested land in the San Jacinto Mountains. Academy students receive a challenging college preparatory academic curriculum while engaging in pre-professional training in their chosen arts discipline. The school is also home to its world-renowned summer program that serves children starting at age 5 through adults age 95. Idlewild Arts believes that art is the greatest teacher of humanity and that the practice of creativity, no matter the ultimate expression, hones each individual's desire and ability to craft global change. To learn more, visit idlewildarts.org. Use code OneWorld2023 to receive a $5 discount to the 2023 Kids and Teens Summer Program. This is One World, One Idlewild, the series, presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. My name is Pamela Jordan. I'm delighted to bring to you a conversation that I had on January 15th, 2021 with friend and mentor, Ravita Bowers. I met Ravita as I was entering my first year as head of school, and she was the lead faculty at the National Association of Independent Schools Institute for New Heads. Enjoy. You've been in Los Angeles, California all of your life, but nearly a century ago, your family relocated to Los Angeles from Tulsa, Oklahoma, following the Tulsa riot of 1921. For our listeners who may not know about this atrocity, the Tulsa riot is more accurately known as the Black Wall Street Massacre and is considered the worst race riot in the history of the United States. Now, many people are only recently learning of this event because there was great effort to cover up the fact that it ever happened. Can you tell us a bit about what life would have been like in Greenwood, Oklahoma, the area known as Black Wall Street? My grandmother and grandfather moved to Tulsa from North Carolina, actually, when they heard that Tulsa had land in the Greenwood suburb, which was a suburb of Tulsa, where black families from all over the country and particularly educated and professional couples and families were moving to start a community of their own. And so they moved when my mother was a baby actually. And my aunt, my mother was the middle child of three. In 1921, my mother was about to celebrate her sixth birthday. Um, her great grand, her grandparents were moving to Tulsa the week before her birthday, her sixth birthday, because they were coming to build a house behind my grandparents' homes. My grandparents, when they arrived in Tulsa, had opened a photography studio. My grandmother opened a music school and also the first preschool in Tulsa. And so they had formed parts of the professional community. And my grandmother's brother had moved to Tulsa to be one of the staff doctors in the black owned hospital. It was the most prosperous black community in 1921. There was an incident that occurred. They had their own movie theaters, their own banks, their own business community, their own school system, their own police and fire departments. I mean, it was a really thriving community in 1921, Oklahoma. There was a lot of anger in the white community that lived in Tulsa, many of whom were in the agricultural community and before the thriving gas community had really gotten off. It to a good start. 
And there was a lot of jealousy in the community. And there was a story about a young boy who was a shoe shine in downtown Tulsa. He worked outside an office building and he would always go to use the bathroom in the building. And from what I remember of the story, he went into the, the office building one day and was in the elevator with a young white girl who was the elevator operator. According to him, the elevator lurched and he bumped into the girl. And afterwards, it was reported that he had put a hand on the young woman in the elevator. She later recanted that story, but not before it spread like wildfire and the young boy was taken into police custody in Tulsa. He was taken into police custody and when word of his arrest spread throughout the black community, they formed together as a group and demanded that he be released into their custody rather than be kept incarcerated until there was a hearing. He was taken back, I understand, to his home in Greenwood and later word spread the ne that night and that day among the Tulsa community and there began a race riot. It was interesting the next day. My great grandparents arrived with their trunks that night and were stored in the hallway of my grandparents' homes. So when the mob started burning down businesses, taking black men into custody, started uh, burning down individual homes and driving people in groups into the street. The only thing my grandparents were able to pull out of any of their businesses or their home were the trunks that were in the front hallway that my grandparents had brought the night before. So over the three days of the riot, according to the, the history that was recorded in the community at that time, over 300 black people from the Greenwood community were killed, shot or lynched. And most of the community was burned to the ground. The black men were herded together into the fairgrounds and held at gunpoint for several days. And the women were herded into other parts of the community with the children uh, to try and retrieve what they could from the businesses and the homes that were left standing. They were actually, the community was actually bombed. And it's the first time on American soil that Americans have bombed other Americans in the history of the country. And so it was kept out of the history books in the state of Oklahoma until a very enlightened governor in the early 2000s insisted that it be written and taught in the state of Oklahoma. It was known about and taught in other history in other parts of the country, but very little was known. And it's been the inspiration for hearings before Congress and also other documentaries and television series in the last few years. One of the things I heard, they had a, a news uh, paper article um, that was immediately removed from the archives and it was one of the things that helped incite it. But immediately afterward, you couldn't even find the press that had been there. So there was a, a concerted effort to really cover it up. How did your family talk about it um, when you were growing up? Well, you know what? My mother and her sisters, my grandfather, my uncle, my grandmother, and their parents actually stayed to help rebuild Oklahoma. My mother and my father didn't actually move out of Tulsa and out of Oklahoma until they moved during World War II to Los Angeles. So many of their friends who visited Los Angeles and 
in our homes, we always heard the story of the race riots, but we also heard the story about the good people who came and helped the community try to rebuild. And they were people of different ethnicities and people who came from other parts of the state. John Hope Franklin, the revered historian who taught at Harvard was one of the people in the early 2000s who testified before Congress about the race riots because he felt it was so important that the story be in the National Archives. So over time, I grew up in a household where the stories were repeated, but also the stories of all the other people who came into our home of all nationalities and all races, because it wasn't just the black musicians who were welcomed into our home. My father owned a grocery store. And so musicians of all kinds who were down on their luck or people who were down on their luck knew there was always a pot of something cooking on the stove that they could have as a meal when they You've seen so much in your career and in your life. What words of encouragement do you have for students today who are navigating issues of diversity and inclusion, isolation due to the global health pandemic, and so much more? I think the first thing I would tell them is your lived experience is important. Share it. Don't feel in any setting that you're in that your experience doesn't matter and that what you have lived through in your lifetime isn't valuable. It's a valuable teaching lesson for you, but also for others. Be determined to get the most you can from every opportunity and where you don't see opportunities, ask for them. I think that's critically important. Look for mentors and advocates in your life, people who can help open doors or help you find opportunities to share your lived experience and to share school and educational opportunities with you that perhaps you don't know about and wouldn't know about in your present circumstances. And lastly, once you've achieved what you hope to achieve with your educational goals, with your personal goals, with your life goals, then you have an obligation to turn around and mentor someone else and do something for the next generation of kids. It's critically important that we open doors for others. You're listening to One World, One Idlewild, the series presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. My name is Pamela Jordan. We'll be right back. To learn more about the Academy and its world-renowned summer program, please visit idlewildarts.org. To subscribe to the One World, One Idlewild podcast, please visit idlewildarts.org slash the series. At Idlewild Arts, we believe that art is the greatest teacher of humanity and that the practice of creativity hones each individual's desire and ability to craft global change. Please consider supporting the students of Idlewild Arts by visiting idlewildarts.org slash giving to make a gift today. This is One World, One Idlewild, the series, presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. My name is Pamela Jordan. On December 14th, 2020, I spoke with my good friend and colleague, Jason Patera. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So Jason, in September, I believe it was in 2019, you gave a TED Talk, uh, and I was very impressed with that. I think you sent me a text and said, be proud of me, and I was very proud of you. And I went back and listened to that uh, recently. The title of of your uh, presentation was Life at the Intersection of Excellence, Purpose, and Passion. I'm sure you were speaking to a room full of adults, and your advice is good for everyone. But how do you get teenagers to think about what it means to live your best life? That's a great question. So having the opportunity to, to do that talk was, was an incredible experience. And partly because the audience that day 
actually was 100 teenagers, and they had invited young people from all 50 wards of Chicago to be there in the audience, and they asked the speakers that day to deliver a message that they thought would be appropriate for, for teenagers. So I very much had them in mind when I thought about this idea of living at that intersection of excellence and purpose and passion. Uh, I actually think it's easier to get teenagers to think boldly about their dreams. They're, they're not bitter yet. They don't, they don't think it's too late. You can convince a teenager that even if they've never picked up a camera, they can make films one day. You can convince a teenager that, sure, you can write an opera. You, you can get them to believe that. It's the adults that are the problem. Because the adults, once a week I hear some adults say, well, I wish I could play music, but I just don't have any talent. And, and I think that's a bunch of crap that, that so, many, so many adults fall into this trap of you get past a certain age and you become resigned to the box that you live in. And then your goals that year tend to become not, they're not goals that would have inspired the 17-year-old self. You're saying, I, I, this year I resolved to get my taxes done on time and I'm going to declutter the garage. <laughs> But you suggest that they learn how to play guitar because they're, they're in awe of, of the students at the school. And they, they say, well, oh, I can't. I, I couldn't do that. I'm, I'm 45 or 55 or 65. I, I couldn't learn how to do that thing. So my goal with that message to young people is to help them resist that urge for as long as they can into their lives, as long as they can into adulthood to to constantly reach for the things that matter to them. Um, that doesn't mean that it's bad to want to get your taxes done on time. It doesn't mean that it's bad to wind up in middle management at a corporation somewhere. But I want people to wake up in the morning excited to get out of bed for something. And I want people to go to bed at night reluctantly because they're, they're involved in something that really lights them up. And going to bed is a compromise because that they have to make so that they get the opportunity to do that again tomorrow. I think the earlier we can learn how magical that feels, the more likely young people do that into their lives. And with the message, do something really well that you care about deeply. And if you can parlay that into something that matters to you personally or to people collectively, even better. Don't let go of that. Don't, don't resign yourself. Don't think that that's something attainable to other people. It's not. In that same TED Talk, you spoke about what happens when students relentlessly pursue things that matter. Say more about that. I, I get nervous when schools overly focus on the practical things. And I think, okay, practical things are important. There are skills that we, we need to know to be relevant and useful and functional in our adult lives. But sometimes, sometimes schools do that uh, to the exclusion of what I'm calling the things that matter. And I, I, think, I think there's two sides of this. The, the first part of that is that personal meaning. Um, there is something really special when you look at yourself in the mirror every day and say, I believe in what I'm about to do today. Whatever that is, I get to lead a school and, and I can't imagine doing something else. But there are a thousand things that you could do where you can say, I, I believe in the work that I'm doing. My father, my father was a machinist and, uh, later in his life and he, 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 he didn't really enjoy it, but he knew that, that he could look at the work with a lot of pride, knowing that that worked that work plugged into a bigger picture that he could see the results of, and, and that, that mattered a lot to him. And if we can take that and do something that affects other people, that makes other people's lives better, or more fulfilling, or more meaningful, or safer, or whatever that is, uh, that's good for everybody. And I think we need more people not only taking those kinds of steps, but believing that they can, believing that they can do things that make a difference. This is One World, One Idlewild, the series, presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. My name is Pamela Jordan. On April 16th, 2021, I spoke with arts educator Rebecca Chu. I first met Rebecca when she was founding School of the Arts Singapore, and I found her journey fascinating. You know, one reason I wanted to do this podcast was to support 
arts leaders and, and education leaders um, and to really share the strong network that we enjoy and call upon as leaders in arts and arts education. Um, I'm approached very often, as I'm sure you are, by people around the world who are considering starting an art school. Now, you were the founding principal of, Sing of School of the Arts Singapore, and I heard you once say that starting the school was both exciting and daunting. Who decided that Singapore should have a secondary school with a focus on the arts, and why was that decision made? Because I, I heard a lot um, about uh, having arts at the college level. Uh, but this was a decision to really have it at a, a younger level, at a high school level. Talk about that decision. The decision to, to think about having a specialized arts school uh, started with the Renaissance City Report in 2000. And that gathered a forum of many different parts and levels of society in Singapore, thinking about a future. It was a futuring exercise. It wasn't just uh, one body deciding and that's it. The future, the hopes and the aspirations were for our young people. What kind of scenario would they be walking into, into the workplace? Not only with the arts, but with the skills and competencies that were relevant for, to survive for us as a small city nation in Singapore. At 2000, we were thinking of how could we then create new ways of seeing and knowing that we ourselves had not experienced as adults. That was the daunting part because no one had created a school, not as a hothouse, but also academically strong. So we wanted to work from a position of strength and finding children that were not virtuosic only or that only X number of students are protégés, but not to hothouse them but to provide them an education that is holistic so at the I think at the really fundamental is a moral compass that drove a decision of wanting the children to what values would they be having what kind of aptitudes and dispositions they would be having and that began the, the origins of the the SOTA what for me was very daunting was is a blank canvas and we always talk about that in the school because when there's a blank canvas, it's just to have an, one idea strong enough to create many ideas, family, whoa, that's really just, you got to dive deep in and ask. You can't do it alone. You just got to get many collaborators, many teams of people as diverse and, and as opposite as yourself in thinking and to hold that ambiguity in design and be ready to crash out like when you mold clay and you don't think that ceramics will work, you just take the pot and have the courage to just break it and start molding the clay all over again. That daunting sight, not just blank canvas, taking something up, happened at the beginning of SOTA. All of us as a small team of teachers, we were so happy and, and, and grateful that we had uh, designed the curriculum. <laughs> We walked three weeks into the curriculum and it didn't work. It was just pitched to a difficult level. And our potter, ceramist Jesse Lim, one of our foremost Singapore artists, stood up during our staff meeting and said, come on, let's break it. Let's start all over again. Everybody went, my precious designed artwork. The curriculum didn't work because it was just pitched to a higher level. So, you know, the ideation for SOTA is just not just about one um, central government body decision. It's a whole community that builds, a whole village of teachers. And over years, you know, as schools grow, not just for 10 years, 50 years, I hope, 100 years, more than 100 years to come, different teams of people will have to put their will to create, to lead, and at different times, that artwork would change and morph over time. So my privilege actually, Pam, was at that particular time when we started it. The design started in 2002. The talking and ideation began at 2000. But SOTA was only opened in 2018. <laughs> that amount of talking gave the school a great impetus to look into difficulties from ideation, construction, finding the people, and then finally to the people who graduated. 
you know, this process of the systematic longitudinal thinking and uh, really adaptive thinking across time is not something very, well, usual for educators who like to have fixed structures to drive curriculum. And today we have still faced with the same problems with adult learning. For me, even now at HIHS, uh, Holy Innocence High School, I'm confronted not about the students learning, I'm confronted about the adults willing to transform their way of thinking to be adaptable to change and how to lead with the courage, even though our own schooling, our own school, adult school, how what we went through, what we lived through may not be relevant to the young 13 year old walking into the new collaborative workplace. You and I can't predict that future, but what is most important, and I've learned from this lesson from SOTA, from the Singapore Academy of Teachers, this whole idea of being resilient and taking 100% risk. It's 50-50. <laughs> but then when you arrive at some point, you must be say, you must be courageous enough to say, I'm going to break it. I've got to readapt. I've got to change the structure. But you know it has a long tail. Systemically, structures drive behavior and the people at the last tail of the end, you just need to win them over. So if anything about this arts focus is taught us about the framing with a crazy imagination to vary from the norm. And when you arrive somewhere, you call the norm, it's ready to break again. And you just got to do an improvisation before it stabilizes again. If not, break the beautiful ceramic pot and mold again. You know, even in schools where the arts are not are taught to a much lesser degree, school leaders feel the strain of balancing resources of time and money. And far too often, they cut the arts from the curriculum or they're, as we say, watered down in some way. What is your personal message to school leaders in terms of their role and the difference that the arts can make in, in, in learning? What would you say to the leader? To the leader, the, I said earlier before, the arts is life-giving. It's life-transforming. It doesn't need to be just uh, because you do not have enough funds and resources and therefore it is marginalized. It lives and breathes through maths, the way you draw your 10 grams and we can calculate angles and we can color it beautifully because next time there will be the architecture drawings for our future buildings and the underground worlds that will be coming. The arts and music, literature, poetry, because it's life-giving to the school leader, normal day-to-day -day operations can breathe the arts through the way we express ourselves, through the walls that we build, bring the expressions we put up, the way we paint our classrooms, the way we do our landscape within our school, the flowers we grow, the trees we grow, and how we appreciate the seasons of our life together with the seasons that's happening around us. It does not necessarily have to be confined within the classroom. So because it's life transforming, the way you see the world and how you perceive it, the canvas therefore in the school landscape goes beyond just a textbook. It goes beyond also just a personal digital device. It's life. And the way you live life with the kids in your school community would also embrace the arts because of the way you see and respect nature, life-giving, the way things go around you in day to day. I, as we wrap up, I, I kept thinking while you were talking, I, I, love, I love the passion that you bring. It's, it's just as the day that I met you when you were looking at a blank canvas. Um, really, would you just share um, or, or, or encourage, how would you encourage educators today uh, especially, you know, we're, we're talking at this time when we're all dealing with the global health pandemic and we're dealing with coming out of that. Just what would you say to encourage uh, everyone, educational leaders, arts leaders, teachers, and parents, what is your message to them today? Have the courage to lead in all the areas you're leading in your families, 
your schools, your communities, have the compassion to serve with humility of heart. Because not only brave hearts and stout minds will make us, will see us through the pray, give thanks for every blessing that comes our way. And then the journey becomes easier when you open your heart to have a conversation, to be present, to listen to the other. And when you respect those norms, I think the conversations will be easier. The journey forward when we come back together as schools. Singapore, all schools are in full swing. We have all the kids back in school. I have a, I have a school population of 1,100. And each time and each year when we come together, these are the things that we would say each morning. Thank you. It's it's a great morning. Have an awesome week ahead. We do not know what lies ahead. We, we thank God that it's a great day and we move on again. The opportunity to be honest with your child is precious because the child learns that from you, parents. We receive that from our own teachers, from our own parents. But even if you didn't have an opportunity from your own parents or guardians, you can create that opportunity with your child and your children. And teachers, that's where you stand in the gap. Because within the community, you can impact and influence because you're an educator. You'll be called as a vocation to be an educator. It's a privilege that I met Pam when she was in that school. And I asked her this difficult moment when I was filled with, oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to start a school. She looked at me and she said, you just do it, girl. Just do it. <laughs> that, that fateful short one hour sitting down with Pam was so impactful and I invited her to be one of the great speakers back, not only in, in our school this, at SOTA, but also at our national conference for the arts educators nationally. I'm very grateful for the time that she's given to us to, um, an opportunity to learn from her wisdom. Pam Jordan is a, a wise counsellor. You have, you have her on board on your team. Ask her for all her nuggets of wisdom. She is she's not only an old trooper, she's innovative, creative, really, really a person of genuine warmth, lots of compassion. It's a privilege, Pam, to have your friendship and your guidance and your leadership in the arts field all the time. And I thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm deeply touched. If we, uh, if we were in a room together, you would see that I am blushing. <laughs> this is One World, One Idlewild, the series, presented by Idlewild Arts Foundation. My name is Pamela Jordan. On March 14th, 2021, I spoke with Stephen Levine as he reflected on his life and work with artists, entrepreneurs, and philanthropists. I've heard you talk about your experience at CalArts following the North Ridge earthquake in 1994. I was reminded of 9-11 uh, uh, when I was at my previous school, which was located in, uh, just uh, near downtown Chicago, and public transportation and all of the roadways were shut down early in the day because the government really didn't know exactly what was going on. And it was so difficult to get to my school, and I was desperate to get to my school uh, to see you know, the students who were already there. Um, and as I understand it, when the North Ridge earthquake occurred, you were actually on vacation with your wife. How difficult was it for you to get to the school? And what did you find when you got there? It's a, it's a nice story. We were up in Mendocino celebrating her birthday uh, in a place we love. And we went in to a bookstore to buy the Sunday Times and uh, heard someone saying, um, uh, I can't get a line through to Los Angeles on the telephone. And somebody else said, well, whenever there's a disaster, you can't get through on the telephone. And that was the first we heard of it. We called Janet's mother um, uh, who said, oh, it's awful. But Janet's mother often thought things were awful. So I didn't, again, I didn't take it very seriously. Uh, we flew back, we had to go to Santa Barbara. We couldn't fly into Los Angeles. The airports were closed. Uh, my, my wonderful secretary for the whole time I was there, Judy McGinnis came and picked, picked us up and drove us to our home, which had survived all right. Uh, and we drove out to campus and, um, 
the first thing you're aware of is there was no electricity any longer and our building has a lot of floors that are below ground. And so it was totally dark. And you were aware that anything that could have fallen down, including whole banks of computers had fallen down, but we, we didn't know how bad the damage was. Uh, and then over the next couple of days, we realized we'd lost the use of our, all our educational facilities. Um, and it was, we were in the midst of registration uh, for the second semester. So the students had returned? The, they, students, they... the students had returned. Oh. And luckily the dorms had survived. Uh, and a lot of students, the graduate students live in the neighborhood. Um, and I remember the, the head of ed, uh, admissions drove her mobile home to campus because she could use the battery from the mobile home and the generators from the mobile to run the computers so she could register people. Um, and then we had to face, how are we going to have a semester when we have no, no place to teach any longer? Uh, at, at first, I was just paralyzed. Uh, there, there isn't a book on what you do when you've lost everything. And then um, I realized, I think the first realization is we're going to need space. There's, there's no way to run a school if there's no place to put people. And I think it was probably the head of advancement said, well, we should set up some tents. We can get party tents and that'll buy us some time to find space. And so we put up 12 party tents and each of the schools got a party tent of their own. Luckily it wasn't raining. Uh, and each of the administrative units got a party tent. Um, and then I just asked uh, basically every administrator to go out and rent everything they could find. Don't even ask what it's for. Just in, in a day or two, it's all gonna be gone because everybody's gonna have damage. So just rent anything you see and we'll figure out afterward what to do with it. Um, and then each day at the end of the day, this may be more answer than you wanted. I'm sorry. No, I, 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 I'm mesmerized. I love it. I love hearing about it. Each day at the end of the day, our, our big fear, and I, I'm sure it's like colleges felt and, and, and schools have felt this year, that if the, if the students didn't enroll, um, we would lose not only whatever it was going to cost to rebuild the facility, and we had no idea what that was going to be, but if, but with, if we lost the entire semester's tuition um, and faculty were already on contract, um, we probably couldn't survive. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't have a big endowment at that point. Um, and so just, we just had to go on. And each day at the end of the day, I would meet all the students outside the building because you couldn't go in. And I just tell them what we acquired that day and who was gonna go where. And meanwhile, the, and this is about the wonderful faculty that schools like yours and colleges like CalArts have. Um, each, each school picked their most powerful speaker, lecturer, basically. There's very little lecturing at CalArts, mm -hmm. but there wasn't much you could do in a party tent besides teach by talking. Um, so each one put their best teacher uh, to lead everyone in the school in a class while the rest of the faculty figured out how, the, how they were gonna pr provide their semester. Um, and Again, I, I, I expect just like Idlewild, the, the, um, the loyalty of the faculty, the students, they were determined that they were gonna deliver somehow, uh, that that's what they were there for. And I think we've seen that all over the country as faculty have tried to deliver during the pandemic in, in ways they never imagined. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, I think about when, when everyone was pushed, suddenly pushed online, pushed into distance learning. And, um, you know, at, at Idlewild Arts also, we're very hands-on, especially, especially when you think of the arts. And uh, there's no doubt we could not have continued forward uh, without the Herculean effort of those teachers determined not just to educate the students, but to connect with them, to be that anchor for them, that everything was going to be okay. And in our, in our situation, you know, our students are spread out on five continents. They were, they were teaching, you know, getting up at 
three and four and five in the morning so that they could teach students and, you know, give private lessons at nine o'clock at night. It was just extraordinary. But, uh, um, and I think a crisis will, you know, cause people to rise to that and just to know that, that who you are as a community, we end each one of our school gatherings where we say to the kids, remember who you are and what you stand for. And this community really rose to that as we've, if we've continued through the pandemic. No, and it was a wonderful feeling being, this isn't a nice metaphor, but it was like you were soldiers together in this war. Um, and I remember in my father's gener, my father was quite a lot older than one would assume. Um, and his generation had fought in World War II. And for many of them, not my dad, who was a doctor, it was the greatest experience in their lives. Uh, and the experience was of comradeship. Uh, not of the war, but of being with other people and your lives depending on it. And that's how it felt uh, to be working. And no one reasoned, this is my job description. Uh, I can't do this because um, the, the building was immediately red tagged. You weren't allowed in. But the food service people knew that without electricity, the food that was in the freezers would spoil uh, in the next 24 hours. And so they broke the rules and they went in and they, they uh, got the food out of the refrigerator so we could start offering meals. And I said, how are you gonna offer meals? And they said, well, we've all worked for caterers in the past, we can cook on outdoor grills. Um, and they just did it. It didn't take, have to direct them to do it. It was it, beautiful. It's, it's a remarkable story of resilience. It really is. Y you know, I, one of the things I heard you say that just resonated with me uh, was that when you look back or while you were in it even, you realize that you had been thinking too small, you know, that your community really rose the, from the board, the teachers, administrators, they really rose to meet that moment. And you realize that, that you had probably been thinking too small. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, when, when I arrived at Cal Arts in 88, uh, they'd had five years of deficit had drawn down the little endowment they had. Uh, I remember what the treasurer at the Rockefeller Foundation said, don't go there. I remember his phrase was, it shipped for voyage. He said, they're gonna go out of business, this is structural. And I believe then, and I still believe that if you're dealing with something that's great, there'll be a way to go on. It's not obvious, but there will be a way to do it. Uh, and so I went anyway, uh, but I was used to, I had had five years in which every hundred dollars was a decision because we were in deficit and it was how much you could reduce the deficit, not what, how much more you could spend. Uh, and we had finally gotten to a balanced budget. In fact, on New Year's Eve before the earthquake, my wife and I toasted the fact that CalArts was safe, uh, that we'd, we'd gotten it out of this hole and we had some fresh leadership and it, everything was gonna be fine. And then 17 days later, you realize you're never safe. It's just an illusion. Um, so, and, and then in the course of rebuilding, uh, we worked crews 24 hours a day, six days a week, because we figured if we weren't rebuilt by fall, gradually we discovered we had $40 million worth of damage. And at that point, maybe $10 million in, say, in reserve, and that was it. And I had no idea how we we're gonna pay the $40 million uh, I'm glad I didn't know all at once it was going to add up to that. Um, uh, and I also knew if we didn't have campus, and it was one thing for students who are already there to stay, but to ask students to go to college to start a new year in a place without a campus was not going to work. Um, so we had to find a construction company that would agree without knowing how much damage there was, that they would hire enough people to get this done no matter what. And it took all sorts of trustee influence because there were lots of work to do. There was lots of disaster in Los Angeles. Nobody really wanted this job. And someone made somebody else based on their past loyalties take on the work. And then he made his son who was now running the company actually <laughs> do it. Um, but we were wake, we, our project manager would sleep on campus at night. And if we did counter a problem, we would solve it. He'd phone me if it was up above a certain amount. And so we were making $100,000 decisions, $500,000 decisions 
based on a phone conversation in the middle of the night. And it was kind of liber. I mean, it was awful because again, we didn't know how we'd pay for it, but it was liberating to actually be able to take aggressive action. Um, and uh, this is now jumping ahead, but I think up, up till then, um, a lot of faculty thought Calitz was just, it was too good to be true, too idealistic, couldn't possibly survive in the long run. I remember a student uh, faculty trustee saying, we should just spend down the little endowments that left have a good last couple of years and say goodbye, that the Bauhaus didn't last, Black Mountain College didn't last, there's no reason we should. And I said, um, you should have told me this before I came because <laughs> I, I can't live that way. That's, that's not, my, that's just not me. Um, well, after the Northridge earthquake, no one ever talked like that again. We realized that we were actually tough. Um, I think tough the way in good independent schools are tough. Yes. Uh, that you look like you're fragile sometimes, uh, but in fact, uh, you're used to coping with difficulty and finding a way to go forward. Um, and so that, that was really, uh, a great lesson. And in fact, we became much more aggressive in the years we'd, once we'd paid off the money, <laughs> which we found a way to do um, fairly quickly, actually. And you had you had about six months to build back, right? If you were going to start the next school year going into your into your building, right? Yeah. Basically, wow. by the time we started the work, it was six months. It was eight months overall, but it took time to assess, to find a construction company to actually get to the point of rebuilding. It, it gave me the courage after that, that we could start new programs before we knew how we were gonna fund them entirely. That, that we could build things that we didn't know how we're gonna, and I, I mean, within reason. <laughs> um, so it, cha it changed you as a leader? It changed me utterly. Utterly, uh, it, it kind of goes back to the, the 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 story of the book. Failure is what it's all about. My mom, not having been able to have the career she prepared for, kind of gave up on life and, and was a very depressed person. Uh, and I, having failed to be able to cheer her up, lived with a kind of fear of failure. And suddenly, I was encountered. Uh, an impossible situation and we were successful. And it was like I got my, it was like graduating from myself uh, and arriving at a kind of settled, adult, I don't know, adulthood, but something more stable and certain uh, going forward. It changed me utterly. Besides my wife and uh, originally going to CalArts, uh, I would say the best thing that ever happened to me was the Northridge earthquake. Mm. I, I tell my staff all the time in this pandemic, don't waste a good crisis. <laughs> you know, really confront those things that you, you we've known have always been there. Uh, and, and as you said, the way the teachers have responded, what the way everyone has responded, and we see who we are, the moral fiber of who we are, we can do more. And let's not waste this time to think about going back to what we were. You've been listening to One World, One Idlewild, the series. Presented by Idlewell Arts Foundation, we at Idlewell Arts have always believed that art is the greatest teacher of humanity. We continue to believe that the practice of creativity hones a person's desire and ability to affect global change. My name is Pamela Jordan. Thank you for listening to One World, One Idlewild, the series a creation and production of Idlewild Arts Foundation. Executive producer, Pamela Jordan, directed and produced by Rose Colella. Edited, engineered, and mastered by Justin Holmes. Graphic design by Mark Biley. Marketing and publicity by Dana Albright, Molly Maple, and Alice Metcalf. Marketing assistance by Rose Colella. Production and research assistance by Keith Miller. Creative consultation by Palencia Turner. Technical support, John Lawrence, Michael Quick, and Tom Wadbrook. Our theme song is Beaconing, composed and performed by the incomparable Marshall Hawkins.
Pamela Jordan was appointed president of Idlewild Arts Foundation in 2014. Prior to this position, she held the distinction of being the first female and first African-American head of school of the Chicago Academy for the Arts, a position she held for 12 years. She currently serves on the boards of the California Association of Independent Schools, the Association of Boarding Schools, and Art Schools Network. Pamela is also a member of the Global Education Advisory Council for Shanghai Hauer Collegiate School, Kushan. One World, One Idlewild, the series is a production of Idlewild Arts Foundation. Any use of materials, including reproduction, modification, distribution, or republication without the prior written consent of Idlewild Arts Foundation is strictly prohibited.